so um, I've spoken on the women question at Commons University, so I suppose for the last seven years, more maybe, um, and I think uh, over that time um, we've made hopefully some progress in terms of recognising names. I remember the first year speaking about uh, an SR man who was the uh, chair, the first chair of the Genotel, the Women's Department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, was appointed as chair in 1919. One comrade's only memory of her was of her being apparently um, Lenin's lover and of Krupskaya saying it was kind of all right. It was Lenin's wife. So in other words, women being seen in terms of their relationship to men as opposed to their own role in the Russian Revolution. So I think, you know, over the last few years, hopefully I've made some progress in, uh, in uh, uh, informing people, at the very least, of the main uh, women involved in the women's movement and their role. So, okay, so I've done a lot of thinking about today's topics and when Yasmin gave me the name, I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then I thought, well, why, why do they want me to speak on this particular title in this particular way? Women as a barometer, what does that signify? There was an <coughs> argument last year about whether I was expecting too much of the Russian Revolution in terms of the in terms of it not meeting the demands of the women's movement, that I was too critical of the Bolsheviks for their failures. Um, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, the commas want to kind of consider it in terms of how far could the Russian Revolution have gone, what did it signify, what gains were made, and what does that tell you about how progressive that society was. So, okay, so firstly, I would say that the test of any movement as a in terms of women's emancipation, in terms of using women's emancipation as a barometer, is whether the emancipation of women is at the core of that project. And that, to me, means it integrates it into every aspect of the thinking of that project. Um, that it's not like a sectional project. I'm not a feminist. I'm not a socialist feminist or a Marxist feminist. I'm a Marxist. I believe that Marxism provides the framework for the emancipation of women along with all of society. I believe that that's, that's the approach that uh, Marxists and socialists should have. And I think that adding on the word feminist doesn't actually uh, really get us anywhere. And it actually really divides the question off from the core task of, uh, of, Mar of, of communism, of socialism, of human liberation. So I would say that it's a, the question of uh, development of women's role in society comes in terms of developing democracy. Um, and it also has to be seen as a universal project in that it's not like just about women, you know, getting equal wages alongside men, although obviously that's a, a good thing, but it depends on what men's wages are as well. We're not talking about universal poverty. We're not talking about reducing things down. We're not about a few more crumbs. We're not about the glass ceiling. We're talking about um, it being a universal project, about uh, the, the emancipation of women being part and parcel of the supersession of the family um, and the supersession of the of the state and um, of loosening the bonds that tie people together in the manner that they exist today and in developing the full freedom I suppose of people um, so it changes human relationships challenges stereotypes and, and I would say that in the um, aftermath of the Russian Revolution, there were many of those factors, many of those issues in terms of new relationships coming into being, in terms of the clashes and contradictions um, between the demands of the genital and the uh, <coughs> attitudes within society and the limitations of that society. So as we all know, Engels wrote very important work, um, the, and, and also Babel did. Um, I think they were both women and socialism before any of us. Um, not exactly sure, it was around the same time. In any event, what they both did was look at the work of, of Henry Morgan, um, an anthropologist, uh, his study of the Iroquois people in North America, and his conclusions about the manner in which primitive communism uh, operated, in 
insofar as that it brought together all the tasks of that society and uh, um, social and, and basically socialised all the tasks, including children's care, um, the uh, food, um, hunting and gathering. You know, all of the all of the aspects of that society that women had been at the core of that society, and that women had in fact been in the leadership of that society. Obviously, I'm not going to go back over that question because that's something that's perhaps can be talked about in the discussion. But we're not talking in the future about going back to primitive society. We're talking about developing society on the basis that we have it today. So how did the Russian Revolution advance the project of the emancipation of women within the socialist project itself? So we can see that from the very beginning of the revolution, from the February Revolution, women were on the streets in, in, in Petrograd. Women were on the move. For many women involved in the women's the Bolshevik women's movement, they saw this as you know this is an extremely exciting time. At long last, they managed to burst through the uh, prison of uh, bourgeois society, and women were on the move. Now, these women that were involved in the strikes and demonstrations that came out from the textile factories in Petrograd, they were in some you know flash in the pan group of people who were there today, then going back home tomorrow. They wanted to be properly represented in whatever the new society was going to bring and we can see that for the rest of that year um, there were strikes, there were demonstrations, there was an organisation set up around the women worker with the name of the journal Rabot Nitsa um, which which okay so 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 um, sometimes there's this uh, idea that the women came onto the streets in February and then kind of the men finished the job off in October. Um, but I would say myself that although unfortunately women were not properly represented in the leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, there's no doubt that they were at the core of all of the events of 1917. In terms of, as I've said, the strikes, demonstrations, the movement itself, the push forward. I mean, it may have been said that they were far too impatient for, for change at the time. Um, in October 1917, women were declared equal after the Russian Revolution under law with men. In December, it was the end of state sanctioned marriage. So, so now I just want to look um, at what I think was extremely important and which was unprecedented, and that were the laws that came into being after the Russian Revolution. The laws, uh, the Family Code in 1918 um, brought about uh, huge changes. So not only now was there, you know, could you get married, register your marriage in a civil, to a civil registry office, you could get divorced on request, there hadn't been any divorce before, um, and neither party to a marriage was, there was no joint property. So basically, both parties to a marriage have their own property, retain their own property, and if they divorce, they took their own property away with them, such as that was. Um, there was no, uh, there was no more. Uh, the concept of illegitimacy um, was uh, removed. Homosexuality was decriminalised, and um, the um, the bonds of marriage, such as had existed under the Tsarist regime, were fundamentally changed. And I think that you can't underestimate the importance of this um, legislation in the sense of the message it sent out to the rest of the world and how fundamentally things can change and how, um, and in such a short space of time. The idea um, behind the um, law, the changes to the law, was that this form of, I suppose, marriage without um, bonds in the sense of free, more free form of marriage was that, that this would facilitate the supersession of the family itself, that it would enable people um, to move on easily um, from a marriage that wasn't um, a happy one, but also more importantly, or uh, more profoundly than that, that it would in the, in the kind of um, vision that had been put forward by Engels, that it would start to remove the state from involvement in marriage, that women and men 
um, and there wasn't gay marriage at the time and there wasn't, you know, there was a lot of things about that question which were not, you know, in any sense dealt with or really perhaps even recognised. But that, but that even within its own um, terms, that this, these, the, I suppose to yourself, it's a, it's a, it was about bringing about an institution that could itself um, wither away. So as we know that um, Engels and Marx and Babel and those who had written about this question previously <coughs> connected the um, supersession, the withering away, we'll say, of the family with the withering away of the state. They were part and parcel of the same project. It wasn't something that was ancillary to it. This was about fundamental change in socialization of all aspects of human society and the liberation of individuals within it, of getting rid of domestic labour as a source of labour, of, of getting rid of childcare as a privatised um, aspect of society. So I would say that this was an extremely important progressive um, set of legislation um, and that um, when we look at it in terms of our barometer, and I'm not exactly sure exactly how barometers work, but I would say it was fair. Anyway, um, so so then the next thing that happens, which again I would say was extremely um, progressive, was the formation of the Genotier, which was the women's department, which came to be the women's department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So in a way it came about because of negative reasons in that during the civil war um, after the overthrow of the of the Zarish regime there was a sense that things were not really happening in the way that women had expected so where there were a lot of women in work at the time civil war was going on there had been a mass influx of women to the workforce during the war who remained there maybe perhaps developed also during the civil war um, as um, different aspects of the of the economy developed in any event that these women were not in a position that they wanted to be in that they you know, that they didn't have support in the workforce um, that they didn't have child care available to them that they didn't have any support in terms of socialization of domestic labor that they still were stuck with domestic labor and with the um, work and the genogel um, was led, as I said earlier, by an SR man. An SR man, Colin Tyne, Madame Kripskaya and other women uh, came together and organised a congress in November 1918, which was attended by women from right across uh, the Soviet Union. And this, of this conference uh, decided that they needed to have special bodies set up to address the women question, and they set up commissions. So moving forward quickly, because this is something I've talked about before, this then led to um, these commissions being set up, which did have a relationship with the party, but not, uh, um, not a, a clear one, I suppose, not, a, not an institutionalised relationship. Um, but that it then was um, brought, in, brought under the leadership of the Central Committee in August 1919, when it was made a department of the Central Committee. So. The idea was that to make sure, they d I think there was a sense that they, they didn't want the communist women's movement or the women's movement to become um, a, uh, an opponent of the new regime of the, of the workers of the Soviet Republic, that they wanted to bring it in under the auspices of that. Now, I would say that that in general was welcomed um, by the women um, at the, in the leadership of that new organisation. So over the next from 1919 until around, if we say 1921, 1922, um, there was a there was a, a, a period of relative um, dynamism, and there was there were lots of problems for the genital. I would say, and I've said this, I've talked about this in previous years, so I don't really want to go into it again. But there were a lot of negative attitudes towards it. It was seen as a nuisance in many respects. It was like I suppose for women who were. Um, who wanted freedom from their uh, situation within the home, um, it was very, very welcome. For many men, um, it, it, it wasn't seen as a welcome um, development, and it was seen in many respects as something which was um, a diversion from the main tasks 
of the Civil War. But in fact, one of the things that the Genital did was mobilize women um, around the fight in the Civil War. So it sent women out as organizers and basically it, 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 um, it, it propagandized for the Soviet Republic to win women onto its side in the Civil War. It set up <coughs> nurseries, literacy centers, um, and one of the most important things it did is that, again, this is an Esther Mann's, uh, um, her, her, her conception, her innovation was uh, an organization called Delegate Meetings, where women in factories and other workplaces and in communities came together. We weren't members of the party necessarily. Um, and they organized the facilities for themselves, they had debates, and also they had um, a trainee system where women would be sent off to a government department or to a factory to train and then come back and the idea was that somebody else would replace them but that that woman would train others. It was really about getting women into the workforce and giving them self-confidence and politics and a sense of identity with the Soviet project. It was about bringing all of society together, the entire working class together, um, and making women an integral part of that. And as part of the um, development of the genital in those years, and it's, it's the part that has been my own research, has been this work in Central Asia, where I think it was uh, extremely innovative in um, um, deciding that because in Uzbekistan in particular, also in Azerbaijan, uh, where women were covered, that they couldn't have the normal approach to work with women, and they set up women-only uh, clubs, cooperatives, and then finally shops where women could come, remove their veil, feel comfortable, be able to sell their goods, if it was a cooperative, uh, and in the shops that there were cooperatives, take part in political discussion, and attain in the process a sense of identification with the project uh, and the ability to develop some sort of economic independence and to move towards in a very different way to that um, in Russia um, full involvement in society. Clearly there was a long way to go with that but I think that it was very nuanced and culturally sensitive and all the comrades will tell you about the fact that they also themselves or the veil going out to see women. I honestly haven't read a great deal about that in the journal. All I really know is that they wanted women to be safe in the environment, so they created safe environments for them to come into to develop themselves politically. So I suppose what I'm saying uh, about this time, that whatever about its problems, and there were many, it, ha it was a time where there was a sense of everything moving forward. Obviously, outside of Russia, we have some the prospect of, of, you know, perhaps revolution. In Europe, there was a sense that society was moving forward despite hardships, and that men and women were moving forward together. There were a lot of changes in terms of people's relationships. Um, and uh, the, um, the most important thing, I suppose, was that there was economic, I, th I think, that there was a, some degree of economic um, independence for women, that, that you know, the general general wanted to make the legal equality real, and they fought for for that within the workplaces. So there was a kind of an, an optimism, really, I think, um, despite all of the um, problems. Okay, okay. So now I just move on to what I think wasn't so good, and that was the introduction of the new economic policy. Um, as comrades will know, this was the decision in 1921 to introduce forms of the market into society, to cut back on the on the um, state um, funding for the state, and to I suppose to reinvigorate the economy and deal with the problems um, with peasantry that needed to be the, the demands um, to deal with that issue in a way that. Um, kept them on board and prevented the Soviet Union collapsing, I suppose, at, at that stage. Um, now, I know that comrades would say, look, there was no, you just had to do it this way, it, it couldn't be avoided, the net was a necessary evil. Um, and I know that people are very critical of the um, workers' opposition in Colentai, 
uh, for making a stand against it and she's been derided and mocked and so the others for their stupidity in, um, in opposing it. But I think that although you can say, you can say all of those things, but I, I still do think that what she was opposing and what others were opposing was the removal of any, was the introduction of the market into society and was the fact that the, in terms of the women's question was that the was that the women and men would be in conflict with each other over a smaller slice of the pie so in around that time women were women were made redundant in in, in their masses it wasn't just NEP, of course, you had the end of the Civil War and returning soldiers. But then women lost their jobs. Women became extremely economically vulnerable in this period. Um, as I said, men and women were now in competition for jobs. There were lots of conflicts around this question. I've read somewhere that women made up something like 60% of the unemployed um, in this period. Um, well, you know, other people may have other figures, but certainly it was extremely significant. It was a profound change. Um, the Genodel's funding was cut. The funding for the cooperatives in the East, which I've spoken about, that was cut. Uh, the women in the smaller cooperative movement, smaller cooperatives, um, which were set up um, in peasant areas and in the East, um, were basically these were not competitive ventures. These were not about making a lot of money. These were about bringing them in to uh, develop their skills and socialize, you know, take, take the handicraft industry from the, from the heart into a collective environment. They were about like lots of other issues about politics, but they certainly weren't about being competitive. They couldn't be competitive. So the fact that this funding was cut, the fact that women were now unemployed, made a huge difference to the whole dynamic of change in the Soviet Union, and I think put it really in a negative direction. Um, you, if you've read um, Alexandra Kollontai's Love of the Worker Bees, you'll see the kind of environment that existed during the net years, which, were, which poisoned relations between men and women, um, which created a whole new, you know, the net men, the kind of I suppose a kind of a narrowness of vision, the vision of seeing men and women together, working together in a socialist project, narrowed to the extent that women were now unemployed, women had to go home or were expected to go home and look after the children, to, to feed the men um, that were returning home from work. There was a lot of prostitution, and in that period, lots of women found themselves in very difficult circumstances. And this whole environment, I suppose, I think was extremely negative. Now, say, well, what, what was there to do? Couldn't be otherwise. You could think, and I know that perhaps people say this was an impossibility. Maybe they could have created some kind of a job share situation. Maybe they could have assisted more in setting up cooperatives. Certainly, I think more could have been done. But the problem was still there. I do agree. The problem was still there. It was such a profound problem. The Soviet Union could not survive, could not continue as it was. And this retreat had profound implications um, for the woman question. Um, so, sorry, I know I'm taking longer than I meant to. Um, so, this it's interesting. Thanks. It's interesting to see how this was. Um, that this retreat was reflected in the law. So there was a debate in 1924-1925 about a new code which was introduced in uh, 19... Well, I think it was 1925, the new code of 1926. Oh, sorry, family code of 1926. It's interesting, a woman called Wendy Goldman, who is a... She's an academic. I wouldn't say she's a Marxist, but she's really, really well informed and very, very worth, worth reading, along, I would say, with other feminist historians who've written on the Soviet Union. They've done, you may not agree with their conclusions, but a lot of them have done a great deal of research and are very informative and useful. Anyway, so she, she, she talks about this, she, she basically follows this debate, 
1925. So it's interesting to say that this was still an open debate. This debate was going on in, in newspapers, at meetings throughout the Soviet Union, and it involved all um, fact, um, the parts of society. The only part it seems to have not really involved is the Central Committee, which was busy tearing itself apart um, in that period. So the, um, the debate was about how to reconcile the ambitions of the revolution with the current situation. Um, and um, so what you had was a sort of an attempt to mesh the, the negative parts of, of what was going on with the aims of the future, or the aims of the revolution, I should say. So what you had, so as I said earlier, you had um, registered marriages, civil registered marriages after 20, after 1919, and, and there were also many, many people who did not register their marriages. So unregistered marriages were just as an important aspect of family life, we'll say, in Russia at that time as unregistered, as registered. So what 1925 did was recognize both. You know, it didn't matter whether you were in a registered or an unregistered marriage, you were you know, you were entitled to the same things from the state, the same recognition. Um, the, the, the problem was, um, in particular, was what she calls alimony. She's an American, I would call spousal maintenance. Okay, so basically what you had was a situation where now the women weren't working, the question of women being paid alimony or spousal maintenance from their ex-partner or their ex-husband was, was a real issue. The decision was that they should pay a third of their wages to their ex-wife, uh, ex-wife, we say ex-wife. This of course caused a huge, huge problem. There was a lot of consternation in the debate around the question over that issue. Obviously it was a financial burden for the men involved. It was particularly a burden and particularly unpopular among the peasantry because in the peasant duvor, the um, peasant farm, the peasant holding, you would have a number of families there together and none of them wanted to pay the ex-wife. You know, they didn't want the money to come out of the peasant holding. They didn't see that it should. Um, um, child maintenance was also obviously a major issue. Um, I don't think that child, I think the alimony didn't exist um, as a legal concept before 25-26, certainly not to the same extent. Um, so, um, they also, also have made uh, divorce more easily available than it had been before. So there was a kind of a, as I say, a mishmash of, uh, of, of law, there was a mishmash of law. Um, an, an attempt to reconcile the um, the ambition with the um, reality, um, and you can see, I suppose, it's just for me to reiterate my point, the very negative impact the lack of economic independence had on the situation at the time. The fact they just couldn't make any progress in that in that situation, and as I said before, it creates a lot of conflicts within society. Um, so um, the uh, the Kolontai, who had actually been kicked out of Russia by that time, sent to be um, an ambassador first in Mexico and then in Norway, um, following her fall from uh, favour um, after the workers' opposition debate and her opposition to NIP, she actually returned to Russia to campaign against the law. And it's interesting because the woman who was actually leading the general at the time, Sofia Smilovich, was for the law because she was aware of the vulnerability of women. Colin Ty's argument was that, um, was that um, to go to men looking for spousal maintenance was really demeaning to women um, and that it really was not something that should be allowed to happen. Um, she thought that it would undermine all the advances that had been made and put men and women in conflict with each other, which as I've said, already said it did. So she campaigned for the state to set up a universal insurance scheme in order to pay um, maintenance for children and, and to, to, to provide for women as well. But that, that didn't happen. Um, that decision was made not to do so. Um, okay. So I've already, I've already dealt with the negative effects of the new economic policy. Okay, so outside of Russia, 
Now, so you could criticise me quite rightly for expecting too much from a, a society which was marooned, which was in, you know, which was in dire economic uh, difficulties, and which was in many respects very backward, with an immense peasant um, component to it. How far could such a society, even if you did, even if you made some concessions, you still were pretty much stuck in terms of being able to properly make any progress, especially financially, to provide financial freedom. So, in, so I want to just look very briefly at the situation in common term. So basically, um, in 1919, there was a proposal made to the first Congress of common term by Colin Ty to form a women's movement within it, and that was adopted in March 1919. Um, in 1920, there was a conference of women from the majority, I suppose, of the Euro European countries, I think also from the United States, that was held in, in Moscow, and it was decided at that to uh, go ahead and form what was called the Communist Women's Movement. So, um, uh, Clara Zetkin uh, drafted a thesis which were adopted by Comintern. I'm not sure whether it was 21, or I think it was 21, which basically committed Comintern, all Comintern parties, to forming sections, commissions, to work to do specific work among women. Um, the uh, Ines Armand, who I've been reading recently, was particularly, I think, bit dogmatic actually in insisting that all the countries, all the sorry, the, the communist parties involved in common term should also um, set up delegate bodies um, of women outside of the party. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that um, proposal at the moment. I formed a journal and Kara Zetkin was the editor of the journal called the Communist Women's International and um, which published for the next five years. The move uh, apparently led, led to the mass recruitment of women to the uh, common term parties, and uh, there's a quote of 100,000 women joined in a very short space of time. Um, now, there were problems. There were, I would say, very regressive attitudes in common term. Um, I'm just going to quote quick, a part of a quotation from Zetkin um, in discussions, uh, I think at Second Congress of, of Commenter. So she says, but mixed into our pleasure regarding these steps is a measure of bitterness. In most countries, the gains of the communist women's movement have been achieved without support from the communist party, indeed in some instances against its open or hidden opposition. There is still insufficient understanding of the fact that without the participation <coughs> in revolutionary struggles of women who are conscious, clear in their goal, certain regarding the path and, and prepared to make sacrifices, the proletariat will be able neither to seize power in civil war nor after establishing its dictatorship to begin constructing a communist society. So that view was echoed by other women in the debate. France was particularly uh, found to be wanting. It set up women's sections in 21 and closed them down after eight months. <coughs> in Britain, I don't know, maybe Linda and maybe other comments will know, I don't know anything about these sections. Um, and I know that there was, there was some uh, republication. There was a um, Communiska, the women's the journal of Genocide, was published in French, German, English, and Russian, uh, one edition, I think, in maybe 22, 23, something like that. Other countries fared better. Czechoslovakia was very progressive. 20% uh, of women joined the party through setting up the sections. In Germany, it was 17%, but I would have thought that Germany already would have had a significant component of women members of the party. In Russia, it was 14. In Britain, I don't know. In 1925, there was a decision made by the by commenter to um, basically more or less close down the communist women's movement and it was made um, a, a component of the executive instead and uh, this more or less a secretariat in 1930 it was closed down in 1930 the genital was closed down so between 1921 and 26 the genital 21, 22, 26, the other genital did struggle. You know, I've already talked about that in previous years. It made some progress. It, it was really battling. 
um, there was then it was more or less liquidated um, from around 28 where the sections were closed down it was unpopular with the trade unions in the workplace it was unpopular with the Soviets it was unpopular um, it was like women's it was kind of like women's question was carping that's how it was seen it was like not seen as something that was integral to the project um, in, in, in Central Asia which is the part of the Soviet Union where I based my study we had spoken about this in previous years, I'm just mentioning it now, the unveiling campaign which was under the um, slogan of liberation, women were um, basically the society of Central Asia was destroyed, uh, the old society was the attack on religion, women went out on marches in, on March the 8th, 1927 at the, uh, on the demands of the Communist Party for a mass unveiling campaign and many hundreds, indeed thousands, were attacked, were killed and the genitals, entire project in Central Asia was destroyed. It's kind of subtle, um, I suppose careful work to draw women into a, a safe environment to begin developing economically, politically, educationally was, was destroyed. The debate, and then there was, there was a final debate in 28 between Nadia Krupskaya and the and Yaroslavsky, who was the leader of the League for the League for the Militant, what's the anti-religious, the anti-religious, the, the, the League of the Militant Godless, yeah, Militant Godless. Um, Anyway, so they, there was that like, actually, uh, you know, her, her, her speech was published in the December issue of Kominiska, his speech was published in the January, and by January you knew, January 29, you knew, you know, it was over. Um, basically, the general were, were told that um, they uh, were to assist the party in cleansing, assist the leadership of the party in cleansing the party of its alien elements, um, but I think that they probably did not do as good a job as they were expected to, and they were, it was closed down in 1930. So, after 1930, there was no organised expression in the same way that there had been. Um, and I, but I would say that from what I've read of the years under Stalin, that despite everything, there, was, there, was, there were attempts by women to try and kind of lessen the difficulty of working in the new environment. Um, but what Stalin did was use women's apparent liberation, um, like a woman, the tractor is the woman sitting up on the tractor, as a symbol for progress in the Soviet Union. But this was a complete distortion of the reality. We've talked about it yesterday with Hillel, the fact that women had a double burden, a triple burden under um, Stalinism, of the fact of the impact that this had on their relationships with men and their ability to express themselves. Um, women abortion was banned, but I think in the early years there was a huge um, occurrence of illegal abortions taking place. Women initially refused to continue to have children for the new regime. Um, there was the continuation of some forms like the creche and uh, Stalovaya, canteens, but they weren't the same. They were, I suppose, they were they were what the new regime co-opted from the early years of the revolution in order to facilitate the um, the uh, effective running of Stalinism. So where you had now women not been working under neck, everybody was working. But to me, well, as I'm sure you would agree, this was not liberation because women were now working in a way that denied them any autonomy and um, subverted their struggle. So um, I would be interested to know more about what happened in the international. There's actually a book going to be published next year um, uh, by um, Daria Jubanka, I think her name is. In any event, there are a couple of people who've been involved in translating the uh, proceedings of the First Congress of the Women's Communist Movement and um, articles and other contributions to that debate. So that's 1920, which will obviously be the 100th uh, year anniversary of the conference to, 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 to uh, set it up. Um, because I, and I just finish with this, I mean, I think 
that, that there is value in looking at what happened in the Soviet Union, particularly in terms of what was attempted, why it failed. Um, and there's, there's value in seeing how readily women identified their struggle for liberation with the struggle for socialism when given the opportunity to play a full role in it. There's, there's room for us to say feminism isn't really, it's not, it's not what women should be orientating towards if given the opportunity to, to collectively struggle with men for a different society where they, have, where they are recognised as equal. Um, but the, 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 the fact that the um, international, um, you know, only lasted five years, I think was clearly, you know, a different issue. Um, and shows to me that the question of women's emancipation had not been absorbed into the communist parties that made up common term. Um, I think that for us as communists, we have to be a voice for women's equality. We have to not just criticize feminism, um, feminist groups for trying to uh, you know, divide women, working class women, from working class men. We have to do more than criticize identity politics. We have to be in the forefront of the struggle for emancipation. And I think the fact that the international wasn't, I mean, in my memory of first going along to Commons Party Britain events was women making tea and cakes. I mean, I think that that wasn't unusual. So it was no wonder when the feminist movement began in the 1960s that the communist movement was found so wanting. 